This will cause massive defaults. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, the next big wave of defaults is months away from beginning, and this one is going to impact more American households than the great financial crisis. And I know we've been talking about the commercial real estate issue and how it's also gonna to lead to a wave of defaults, but the one we're gonna talk about today is the one that I think sets the entire default wave, the next financial crisis in motion. We're gonna look at how the mainstream media's got it completely wrong and even insiders don't even get it. They don't understand what the real truth is here. And we're also gonna talk about the triggering mechanism. What is gonna cause this default wave to begin? We're gonna go dig deep into the data and see just how close we are to that beginning. And on top of that, we've got more evidence that says the Fed is completely wrong. Let's over to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with the headline, car debt is piling up as more Americans owe thousands more than vehicles are worth. And you know, this is really an important topic because we see this negative equity thing that people have financed in their vehicles. They've done it for many years now. The banks were overly willing to, to extend these loans. And you start to think about, you know, you look back to the financial crisis and why are we seeing this in again? Because back then, what did the banks do? They overfinanced homes. They went to, you know, 100% percent loans because they believed the housing market was going to continue to appreciate in value. And now what do we see in the automobile market, these much longer term loans, but the also the belief that cars would appreciate in value. And that's one of the ways our system works. As long as things continue to appreciate in value, it diminishes the value of the loan. But if that switches the other way and you've borrowed too much and the underlying asset goes down, well, now you've got the seeds for the next crisis. The buildup in negative equity or the amount of debt that exceeds a vehicle's value is rattling consumers and raising alarms. Now, it should have been raising alarms years ago within the industry. Although it's not unusual for drivers to carry negative equity, some dealers say more people are arriving at their lots up to 10,000 underwater or upside down on their trade-ins. And now, notably, the dealers are saying, hey, look at all these people showing up at our dealership. Now, this is hilarious because who do you think is selling them these loans and these cars? in the first place. That's right, it's the dealers. People come in, they say, hey, I'd really like that car. And the salespeople, the finance people said, we'd like to sell it to you. And we're, hey, you're in a little upside down on that car. Don't worry, we've got a bank that will lend it to you. And now they're acting surprised. Hey, where did all these people come from? Well, they're the customers you sold cars to. As trading values begin to cool, each month more and more customers will find themselves falling from positive to negative equity. Unless American car shoppers break their habit of buying again too soon, we'll see the negative, negative equity side continue to rise. Well, the reality is we're gonna see the negative equity side rise because the value of cars is coming down. That's what happens when you start to see a deflationary environment starting to form. Values of things go down. When the economy isn't growing enough to keep values up, it goes the other way. Demand falls, price comes down, negative equity goes up, and problems start to persist. This isn't a matter of going back to the dealership and getting another bigger negative equity loan. It's the fact that too many people are going to be underwater. For the typical American, a new car is increasingly out of reach. Today, about two out of 13 people are making monthly payments. If you can get this at $1,000 or more, for many, they claim they have no choice. There's few or no public transportation options and the need for a car to get to work, which is one of the issues we're going to talk about is our triggering mechanism later in today's show or to bring children to school and buy groceries. Because these car loans are generally unaffordable at the outset, that means every month borrowers are getting closer to the financial edge. And what's notable is the dealers know this when they put people in these cars and they lend these loans. They know they're not going to be able to sustain the payments. The finance companies know it as well. They're just hoping to charge enough interest that there's an expected number of defaults. And of course, what we're going to expect to see is when the crisis hits, when the recession now is in full 
full bloom. What do you think people are going to do with their negative equity car loans? Are they going to keep paying on them? Absolutely not. They're going to turn those keys over, let them get repossessed, turn them back to the bank. You're going to see a flood of cars hit the used car market and banks are going to take a hit. It's going to further depress values and cause the cycle to get even worse. But what do you think about all this? Put your thoughts in the comments. Do you think it's normal? Should people have thousand dollar a month car payments or is that just the way things are? Let's continue on. But as more consumers deplete savings accumulated during the pandemic, they're falling underwater again. Well, actually, the data might suggest the other things happening now. We know the personal savings rate got very close to all-time lows, may even tagged it briefly, and now we're starting to see an increase in the savings rate here. Now, if you say, well, maybe that's a good sign, Steve, and well, perhaps it is, but one thing I want to suggest is it's not uncommon when you get into a period where people think the economy is slowing, you're heading to a recession and they're worried about your job. You're, you know, you're looking at your employer you're saying, hey, some other people are getting cut here. Business is slowing down. And what do people start to do? They start to cut their spending. They start to try to pay down their debt and they build up their savings because they're afraid that if they're the next one to go, that they need some money to rely on. So seeing an increase in personal savings here isn't really unexpected. To respond to higher vehicle costs, lenders have kept extending the length of auto loans. Companies such as Upgrade Inc., which offers auto refinancing, are also tightening standards for those who qualify for financing, meaning making it harder for people to get a loan. A trend they predict, well, of course they're going to predict it. They're the ones doing it. We'll continue if the job market worsens. Well, yes, you're not going to lend money to people who don't have jobs. They say the more likely scenario is for worsening of economic conditions combined with the prospects of continued decline in car prices and get this this is how their take on it making it harder for consumers to qualify for the car they want perhaps the reality is consumers they're not going to need a car if they don't have a job maybe they're going to cut back from maybe two or three cars in their household down to one if they don't have the work no the issue upgrade inc isn't that they're not going to be able to buy the car they want the problem is you financed a whole bunch of cars that people can't afford and when we start to see this, it kind of flips out into the broad market and you see the stock market start to come down and people start to cut their spending. And if only there was one way to see that, well, you've got it, CTA Timer Pro, you've seen here on the S&P 500 futures, it warned you it was going short. You see the long, the slower algorithm. This is where a lot of money is positioned on the machines in the market. It's been cutting its long position. It's been warning subscribers, hey, if you've got some gains, start capturing here. You wonder what's been driving bond prices down? Well, the machines, as we talked about on Sunday, and we'll have a further update this Sunday, as long as we have all the data to get the report. There's still a few coupon codes. I put some up for my buddy Jay Bravo when I went on his show uh, recently. There's still a few left in the description below. $10 off, you get 20 bucks and a 30 day money back guarantee. Manufacturer's death has been greatly exaggerated, or manufacturing's death, that is. So now let's talk about the triggering mechanisms here and what is going to cause this tidal wave of defaults to happen. Because if you start to think about it, as long as the economy continues to grow, or perhaps we get this mythical soft landing, which if you kind of wonder what a soft landing is, is when some people lose their job, but not everyone, or maybe your employer says, hey, we're going to cut your hours or your pay, and you're going to be happy about it. It, and then the economy starts to steadily grow again after that. That's the myth of what they're hoping to happen. And now let's look at the manufacturing sector because what we want to see is when people start losing their jobs, they're going to have no choice but to stop making payments on these loans. That's going to hit the banks as the delinquencies turn to defaults and repossessions. And then the tidal wave begins here again manufacturing death greatly exaggerated to the wall street journal well wall street i don't know if that's the case as the institute for supply management on wednesday said its index of factory activity ticked up to a seasonally adjusted 47.7 meaning it contracted at a slower rate in february from the 32 month low of 47.4 back in january again it leaves below 50 indicating that more of the manufacturers experienced reduced activity 
activity than growth. A similar constructed manufacturing index from the S&P Global rose to 47.3 last month from 46.9. So what we're seeing here is evidence that the manufacturing sector is still slowing. Now, in order to be a soft landing, what you'd want to see here is these numbers, hopefully next month, move to say a 50 or a 51, maybe if we're lucky a 52, showing that the contraction is now ending and perhaps a resumption of an expansion. But let's look at some of the comments from this report. And then I want to look at some of the data from the report that says maybe the soft landing isn't going to happen. So here we can see some of the response. Now, we note that there's a lot of these positive responses from consumer and electronics because there's a chip shortage, there's an automobile issue, production shortage, but looks like at some of the other ones here. A slowdown in new housing construction. Remember, housing is a major part of the U.S. economy and concerns of a slowing economy have customers delaying purchases. That's not a good sign in an effort to destock. Business and new orders are softening. Customers are pushing out new orders. That's not a sign of brisk demand it's a sign of just the opposite business conditions are strong however inventory has exceeded our planned levels uh-oh this will impact our operations until inventory is resolved meaning we have to bring our inventory down and slow down our production and while there are lingering concerns about a recession we're not expecting a large drop-off in manufacturing this year worst case is flat well they're hoping that worst case is flat because I want to show you now inside the data here at the ISM. So this is one of the factors we want to see here is we want to see the manufacturing sector growing because we don't want them to start laying off. But what will we need to see before that they start laying off? Well, let's take a look. So here we see the new orders are at 47, meaning they're contracting. There's six months of contraction. Remember, new orders leads the broad manufacturing sector. But now look at employment. It's virtually unchanged, 50.6 to 49.1, meaning there's virtually no change in employment, maybe a slight tiny itty bitty contraction but notably here's one of the issues that i see is backlog of orders you see it down to 45 means contracting and there's five months of a trend so what you can take away from this is that businesses or manufacturers still need employees once they work through the backlog of orders then they go you know, they're going to be facing and looking for new orders which now have been contracting for six months when you finally get to the point where you have no backlog to work on no new orders to work on guess what you don't don't need you don't need a lot of employees so now the key question is how fast do they work through those backlogs because now let's take a look at the unemployment market and see what's going on there as U.S. jobless claims edge lower in the sign of strong labor market, but we're going to get into, again, the data point here that's going to show the Fed's completely wrong. Initial claims remaining very low at 190,000. As many of you know, when this number starts breaking out over 200,000 and growing, we've got major problems. Then we'll see delinquencies. Then we'll see the defaults. Then we'll see the bank gets hit. But look at this. Continued claims, 1.655 million, still holding steady. Total claims, 1.959, down 20,000. A bit of a relief there from the total claims data. But let's look now at what I say is the Fed has got it completely wrong. This proves, again, more evidence. Inflation is coming down. And I'm going to give you a reason why this data also is going to lead to more unemployment claims. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, one of our favorite labor statistics people, revised estimates, because why wouldn't they, for the fourth quarter showed output per hour increased by roughly half as much as initially reported. Strong productivity growth helps offset the inflationary impact, bingo, of rising wages. And report incorporated revised source data that resulted in a substantial increase in hours worked with hampered productivity growth. For all of last year, productivity fell 1.7%, the most since 1974, as labor costs increased 6.5%, the largest in four decades. If you're wondering why productivity is so low when you hire a lot of new employees, well, they certainly don't know where anything is. They don't know how to do anything. But once they're on the job for a while, they get into the flow of how business is done there, what their job is to do, and they get more productive. That's what helps bring inflation down. At the same time, it also brings wages down because your more productive employees become the less employees you need to get the job done unless the economy's booming.
Let's take a look at this chart here. It's non-farm business sector unit labor costs in blue against the consumer price index. And we can see as employee wage costs start to roll over. Remember, this is quarterly data, not the CPI. That's monthly data, as we see in red. But as this peaks and rolls over, it says that wage growth is going to slow. That brings consumer prices down. Of course, that says, Fed, you're wrong. Here we have output per hour. We notice it's at super low levels. Like I said, lowest since 1974. But notice Notably, as productivity increases, I want you to see as productivity increases, what happens to inflation? It comes down. Again, productivity goes up, inflation down. You see this happen over and over. Productivity higher, inflation down. So now we're at the depths here saying the only the next direction is productivity goes up, inflation comes down. And not every time this happens, but I want you to see this chart now. When we take labor productivity, overlay the four week moving average of initial claims, we can see that when productivity comes off low levels and rises well guess what you don't need as many employees so you start to lay them off you see rising productivity often but not always you see here's a period where rising productivity because the economy was strong didn't do it but more times out than not what you see is rising productivity it means higher unemployment claims because as an employer you can start to get rid of some of your worst employees because when you have one employee that can do the job of three you can get rid of two and now we're seeing a Again, signs to say the Fed's got this wrong. We're going to see a recession here. We're going to see people lose their jobs. And since they're upside down on their car loans, you can only now guess how bad this is going to be. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.